So, Seth, there's been some excitement in the SETI community recently, a claim that Russian astronomers may have found an alien signal coming from a nearby star system. Can you help sort this out? Well, indeed. I received an email, as did many people in the SETI community recently, from an Italian astronomer who says the Russians had found a signal in 2015, so more than a year ago, coming from a star, HD 164595, if you want to know the name of it, that's uh, almost 100 light years away, a star system known to have a planet. They said, this could be an interesting SETI signal. So, of course, when somebody blogged about that, the entire world seems to have woken up. Once it becomes blog fodder, then it becomes news, huh? I, I guess so. I mean, you know, the, the media attention has been enormous for this because, after all, you know, the public expects us to eventually find a signal. Well, understandably, people are excited about this. Now, the signal that the Russians say they found, there's no dispute that they found a signal, something, some kind of disturbance. Yes, yes. You can look at the, the data. It's just a plot that they supplied, and there's very little doubt that there's something there. And does it come as a sound? Is it D, D, D? Is it something like that? Or is <laughs> it, it just like an, Sputnik. <laughs> <laughs> or, or is it an aberration on the Well, look, it's all graph. done digitally. I mean, you don't listen to these things. If you listen to them, there'd be white noise. It's like turning on your kitchen faucet. But it's just that at some spot on the radio dial, there's a lot more cosmic static coming in. That's maybe the way to describe it. Now, hang on. In the movie Contact, Jodie Foster was listening with headphones. Are you telling me that's not accurate? Yeah, no, uh, on several counts. To begin with, Jodie Foster is not in our employ. And beyond that, you don't listen with earphones. Our receiver, uh, our receiver has 40 million channels. That's 20 million pairs of earphones. Okay, and the hour there is the SETI Institute, um, but the SETI community, most members in the SETI community received one of these emails. The SETI community is, is much wider. Well, much wider, yeah. I mean, you know, there are a couple of groups around the world, but only a couple. I mean, the total number of people is very small. Okay, so just a few people that can check this out. Well, have you checked it out? Do well, we know whether or not this could be the real thing? Yeah, you know, I was a little skeptical because, it, you know, you kind of wonder if they found it more than a year ago, why didn't they say anything to anybody? And that still remains a bit mysterious. I think it's probably because they didn't believe it themselves. But in any case, we did. We spent days using the Allen Telescope Array, which is, you know, a phalanx of 42 antennas about 300 miles north of San Francisco, actually, looking in the direction of this star system, hoping that we could retrieve that signal, that we could find it too. You know, you know where it is on the sky. This is a well-known star system. It's not terribly far away. It's a sun-like star, by the way. It's a star very much like our own, and it does have at least one planet. So, you know, not an unreasonable place to expect a signal to come from. But bottom line, we didn't find that signal. But absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, as they say in the skeptic community. So just because you didn't find a signal doesn't mean that there wasn't a signal from an alien civilization. No, you're quite right. I mean, it could be that they were on the air and then they went off the air. I mean, that's possible. Who knows what the aliens are doing? On the other hand, it made me and I think many people in the SETI community suspicious that what this was was you know, terrestrial interference, as it's called. You know, it was just a, an airplane with a radar set on it that flew in the vicinity of the Russian radio telescope or just a, a, a satellite passing overhead because they transmit too. Have the Russians made any speculation as to what it is? Well, I think after the media blitz that has followed this whole episode, yes, they, they felt compelled to do something, and uh, they did. They announced that, in fact, they did not think that it was an ET signal at all, that it was most likely a Russian military satellite. Dang. Well, what do you do next then? You know, we may continue to monitor it because, after all, there's some uncertainty there. But look, you know, in the SETI business, there are going to be a lot of false alarms. So you just have to anticipate that that's going to happen, not get discouraged, but just keep looking because, you know, eventually one of these signals will turn out to be real. That's my personal opinion, but uh, that's why we do it. Is it true that there's a bottle of champagne sitting in a refrigerator somewhere for the purposes of celebrating a a signal, a, a bottle that's probably been there for many, many years. Well, it, it, we used to have that bottle of champagne. I don't know if there's one at the Allen Telescope Array. My experience with that, <laughs> that champagne was every time I checked the fridge, it was a different bottle of champagne. <laughs> so I don't think it really sits there for years. <laughs> okay, Seth, thank you. Always a pleasure to be on Big Picture Science. <laughs> I mean, really. Those watching the skies over Chelyabinsk, Russia in February 2013 were witness to a formidable display of fury in the firmament. There was this bright light in the sky and it's getting brighter and brighter, brighter than the sun. And it then explodes. And then suddenly 
the shockwave arrives. Glass and windows break and, and there's a loud, loud noise. People saw all that video for the dash cams <laughs> uh, that they'd never seen before. You know, how many people have actually seen what an asteroid strike looks like and feels like and sounds like? And this, I think, was a little demonstration of what one would be like if it actually hit. That one was pretty minor. What's the difference between an asteroid and a meteor? Well, it depends on where you see them. I mean, the asteroids are out there. There are any rocks smaller than a planet. If you see something in the sky, well, that's a meteor. If it hits the ground, then it becomes a meteorite. Sometimes those meteors, even if they're only the size of a building or so, can do a lot of damage. This is a true black swan event, a very low probability event, but with very, very bad consequences. And those events are really difficult for people to get their heads around. It's the only natural hazard that we can actually avoid because you can't stop tornadoes, you can't stop hurricanes, uh, you can only deal with their effects. But we could actually stop an asteroid impact. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology. And in this episode, we have an eye out for asteroids. Not the big ones like that which deep six the dinosaurs. NASA has its eye on those guys. We're talking smaller ones, such as the one that exploded over Russia. They too can pack quite a punch, but most of them aren't yet in our sights. Find out why. Meanwhile, why wait for the space rock to visit us? NASA launches its first asteroid sample return mission. Space rocks come in all sizes, and we're well aware that the big ones can be catastrophic. The asteroid that slammed into the Earth 65 million years ago had a role in the extinction of nearly 80% of all species of animals, including, most famously, the dinosaurs. Rocks that pose an existential threat to Earth have even become a staple of Hollywood. What is this thing? It's an asteroid, sir. How big are we talking? It's the size of Texas, Mr. President. What kind of damage are we? Damage? Total, sir. It's what we call a global killer. The end of mankind. Doesn't matter where it hits, nothing would survive, not even bacteria. My God. In the disaster thriller Armageddon, a killer rock is headed for Earth. So naturally, a deep core driller, played by Bruce Willis and his hard hat buddies, land on the asteroid and stuff it with a nuclear bomb, kind of like the proverbial pimento in the olive. One massive explosion later and, <laughs> surprise, humanity is saved. But we know about large space rocks. Frankly, we're not too worried about them. NASA is tracking them, but even smaller rocks can do damage when they plunge through our atmosphere, and most are not either known or tracked. The Russian city of Chelyabinsk in the Ural Mountains was the host of such an unexpected visitor in February 2013. It streaked across the sky at more than 40,000 miles or 70,000 kilometers an hour, and then it exploded. So the amount of energy released was 500 kilotons, and to put that in perspective, that's 40 times the Hiroshima bomb. Peter Yaniskins is a senior scientist at the SETI Institute. We were very lucky with Charlie Bins that it exploded very high in the atmosphere at 30 kilometers altitude. And as a result, uh, most of the damage was done by the shockwave coming down. And that meant thousands and thousands of windows breaking, doors being blown in, uh, at some point people being blown off their feet. Uh, a lot of damage was caused by flying glass. Uh, in the end, uh, some 1,600 people ended up uh, going to the hospital to get medical treatment for their injuries. Everybody knows that asteroids are up there in the sky, but, you know, more specifically, where do they come from? Asteroids come from the main asteroid belt. Uh, there is a big population out there. Uh, they uh, frequently collide with each other and create these debris fields. And uh, small pieces in these debris fields evolve to 
then come to us. So they get kicked into a different orbit and might intersect the Earth. Yes, and the kicking is done by Jupiter. It's really the uh, sort of the resonating between the orbit of the asteroid and the orbit of Jupiter that uh, makes these orbits change. And what causes them to explode? I mean, when they, they hit the atmosphere, they, they take a dislike to Earth or Earth takes a dislike to them. Put your feet on the ground, look straight ahead and ask yourself, how fast are you moving? Well, you're moving 30 kilometers per second through space. And that's, that's the danger of these rocks. These rocks are hitting us at incredible speeds. The thing the atmosphere does is it, it fragments, it breaks up the asteroid. As soon as uh, this thing is in small pieces, then the pieces are, are very quickly stopped. And it's the stopping that releases all the kinetic energy. That's when you lose all that, that forward motion. That's when they light up. And that's when they, they get this bright glow and they explode. Peter, just as most people run away from storms, most people would be expected to run away from a small asteroid that's going to hit the Earth, but you're not among them. No, uh, small asteroid impacts are very interesting because a small asteroid you can see coming in. You can study it when it's still in space. You can measure its size, its shape, how it's spinning, how it's rotating, what sort of orientation it's coming into the Earth's atmosphere. Now, if you are a modeler, if you really try to understand what's going to happen the next time this occurs, uh, you want to you wanna know the shape, you want to be able to put all that in your computer models and then correctly calculate what the outcome is, what altitude is this thing breaking apart and how is it breaking apart. And for that, I want to see one of these cases. I want to I wanna go to the place where uh, a small asteroid that's seen coming in, that has been studied in space, where that thing enters the Earth's atmosphere and creates a bright fireball. Okay, but presumably you would go there after any impact. Uh, while it's happening. So uh, you get some warning, and the warning time is going to be very short. Think a day, think uh, just a few days, uh, which means uh, you have to be quick to go there. And also, uh, you know, we live on planet ocean. Two-thirds of the Earth is ocean, so chances are it's going to be somewhere over the ocean. That means the only way to do this is by flying. So what I need is I need a business jet on standby, somebody willing to give me a ride, go there on very short notice and then take us to the place where the impact happens at a safe distance, you know, 100, 200 kilometers away, and then observe this, uh, this impact. Asteroid chaser Peter Yeniskins is a senior scientist at the SETI Institute. The rock that exploded over Chelyabinsk was not considered particularly big by astronomers. It was about the size of an apartment block. But if a rock that size is hurling your way, you probably wouldn't say it was a mere pipsqueak. So let's do the measurements, what scientists consider big and small when it comes to asteroids. Now, the large asteroid that killed off the dinosaurs was about six miles or 10 kilometers across. That's about the size of downtown Washington, D.C. Of rocks that size or bigger, NASA has identified 95 percent of them, knows their orbits, and assures us that none is headed our way in the near future. So no extinction level events that we can foresee. Okay, but let's go smaller. Of medium-sized asteroids, the diameter of a half a mile to six miles are between one kilometer and ten. Ninety percent are pegged and under surveillance. So checking the threat from medium-sized space rocks, check. So what do scientists consider a small asteroid? Well, those are less than half a mile, that is to say, less than one kilometer across. Chelyabinsk, at 65 feet or 20 meters, easily fits in that category. And asteroids that size are largely unknown. Keeping the planet safe from threatening asteroids of all sizes is a NASA job position. I'm David Morrison. I'm a senior scientist at NASA Ames, and I'm the chief scientist for the Ames study of planetary defense from asteroids. Over the years, the responsibility of urging the public and Congress to take the monitoring of potentially end-of-world asteroids seriously earned Dr. Morrison the nickname Dr. Doom. Dave, are you still called Dr. Doom? <laughs> no, I don't go by Dr. Doom. But it's an interesting point because actually, because we have done the survey for the big ones, I'm no longer in the mode of trying to tell people we've got to go do something. I think we've done the main part. But he's not ready to exhale, as we learned. Even a Chelyabinsk-sized rock can pack a wallop. The break point is at about one mile. And smaller than that, the asteroids produce essentially local damage if they hit, as opposed to global. What, what about the asteroid that broke up in the skies over the Russian city of Chelyabinsk in 2013? How big was that asteroid? That asteroid was about 20 meters across. It was the size of a multi-story building. 
and it certainly produced a dramatic event, the only one we've actually seen and studied uh, of where an asteroid hit the Earth within our lifetimes. But, but it didn't kill anybody. No, it didn't. It did a lot of damage, but it was minor damage. In fact, if we estimate the damage from small asteroids, it's equivalent to a few people a year. In other words, you could kill more people in an automobile accident than the annual average from these small asteroids. How is it that people die from asteroid impact? An asteroid comes in at a cosmic velocity, a tremendous velocity, many times greater than a bullet. And so when it comes in, it explodes. And the effect of the asteroid is rather similar to a nuclear explosion. And that is the consequences. Buildings collapse. Uh, it's pretty nasty if you're near the point of contact. Well, you said that this is the only asteroid impact we've actually <laughs> been able to witness. Uh, but then again, we've only been paying attention fairly recently. How often does something that size actually hit the Earth? Surely we have some idea of that. A chelyabin sized asteroid hits the Earth every decade or two, but the vast majority of those are ignored. They land in the ocean, they land in wilderness, they don't actually do any damage. Do we see them? I mean, do we even know about them? We wouldn't necessarily see them. As our surveys get better, as our connection with people uh, with dash cams like at Chelyabinsk, we're going to get the information on objects that were previously unknown or ignored. So what you're saying is that Chelyabinsk events happen every decade or two, but they seldom kill anyone. On the other hand, there, there are asteroids as big as, I don't know, the Rose Bowl, and they're still considered small asteroids, but they could kill a few hundred or a few thousand people. So on average, it comes out to two people a year. That's correct. And so just looking at the average is a little bit deceptive. Well, I know that we're tracking the big rocks, the, the very big ones, the ones that you know, we consider the rocks of doom. But these smaller rocks that you refer to, are they tracked and are they known to us? Our telescopes are looking all the time. We do surveys of the whole sky, and if an object comes close enough to be bright enough to be seen, then we get it. That could be a big object moderately far away or a small object very close. For the small objects, it takes a long time to pick them up because our field of view is too small, and we would need bigger telescopes if we wanted to do a more complete survey. Dave, have you ever seen an asteroid come into the Earth's atmosphere and hit the Earth? Have I ever seen an yeah, asteroid you... coming through the atmosphere? Anytime you look up at the night sky, you will see an occasional meteor and even a bright one called a bolide. That is an asteroidal fragment hitting the atmosphere, but it doesn't get to the ground. And no, I've never seen one that came to the ground. Yeah, if you had, you'd probably have it on your mantle, right? <laughs> if I had, I would have probably be famous. <laughs> How long does it take for a, a space rock to cool off so that you can pick it up? A space rock lands cold, basically. It does. That's a contradiction. People think that, that uh, meteorites will cause fires, and they don't, because it's cold in space. It hits the atmosphere, and the surface gets hot for maybe three or four seconds, and then by the time it gets to the ground, it's cooled again. I'd like to get back to the, uh, the danger from these relatively small asteroids. Now, th that includes things that are indeed hundreds of meters across, because those are not the, the, the killer variety. What fraction of the asteroids that are relatively small do we know about? I mean, are, are we at the 1% level or the 90% level? Where are we? For the big ones, the, the ones that could produce a global disaster, uh, we now have found 96 or 97 or 98 percent of them. We're almost complete. As you go smaller and smaller, the fraction we have found becomes uh, worse. At 500 meters, we found half of them. At 300 meters, 10 percent. At 100 meters, 1 percent. And so, it, obviously, the smaller objects are harder to find. Okay, so, but that means, the implication of that, is that uh, a rock could wipe out the downtown area of San Francisco tomorrow without any warning. That's absolutely correct, but the probability is low. But Seth, isn't that sort of fear-mongering, too? Don't we need to put this into perspective in terms of what the actual risk is? I mean, wouldn't there be more risk, Dave, by driving or infectious disease than there is from the possibility that you will be wiped out by an asteroid? I think that is the right attitude if you think about averages. 
But there is always that possibility that an asteroid could come in that's big enough or is aimed at the center of San Francisco that would be truly tragic, far more than any cumulative effect of automobile accidents. You know, you point out that uh, these frequent small rocks mostly land in places where they don't really do any bad things, right? And they're landing in the ocean and so forth. But that that does beg the question. I mean, if they landed in the ocean, say, 50 miles off the coast of Atlantic City, New Jersey, uh, would there be a tsunami to worry about? Certainly a tsunami can be produced by an impact, by an object hitting the ocean. We think that the tsunamis are not as dangerous as those produced from earthquakes, seismic tsunamis. They tend to dissipate their energy more quickly. So 50 miles off the coast, yes. 150 miles off the coast, the wave would never make it to the shore. For years, David, you have been concerned about the big rocks from space. Those are existential threats. These don't seem to be existential. They are threats. They are things that have to be dealt with. How concerned are you? Are you losing sleep at night because of uh, the rocks we haven't found? I'm not worried about the rocks we haven't found because we're still making good progress in finding them. On average, it's not a serious problem, but we still have to consider the possibility of an impact that could kill a million people or could wipe out a city or could damage critical infrastructure. It's a low probability, but you can't dismiss it. Dave Morrison, thanks so very much for uh, speaking with us here. My pleasure. Dave Morrison is a senior scientist at NASA Ames Research Center. Well, it sounds like being hit by a small asteroid is a rare event. Rare, but not nil. Just two days after we talked to Dave, Earth had a close call with a small asteroid. That story next. Plus, why we're not very good at preparing for low-risk, high-impact events. And want to swap your meteorite for cash? Well, first you have to authenticate it. It's Asteroids on Big Picture Science. Support for Big Picture Science comes from the Making and Science team at Google. Introducing Science Journal, an app to explore and measure light, sound, acceleration, and other natural phenomena. Do you have a question about your environment or a project you've built? Find the Science Journal app, hands-on activities, and more at g.co slash science journal app and start investigating. This next bit, if it were a plot device in a movie, might require you to suspend disbelief. While we've been putting together this episode of Big Picture Science, weighing the risk of small asteroids hitting the Earth, a small asteroid, as if on cue, decided to pay a neighborly call. A previously undiscovered asteroid whizzed by our planet on August 28, 2016, just hours after astronomers first spotted it. It was 80 to 180 feet in size, or 25 to 55 meters, so slightly larger than the one that exploded over Chelyabinsk. And it came within 50,000 miles, or 80,000 kilometers, of Earth. Well, that's about a fifth of the distance to the moon, so you could almost feel the wind on that one, if there was any wind to feel in space. But the asteroid called QA2, passed by harmlessly. It's a reminder that while smaller asteroids, the size that would fit in Central Park, are less dangerous than their bigger brethren, there are millions of times more of them, and some may be headed for Earth. So why are they so hard to spot? It's been likened to finding a black cat in a mine when you don't have any lights. Astronomer J. L. Galache at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics says that near-Earth asteroids, or NEOs, are dark. The brightest ones only reflect about 20% of the light that hits them, and the darkest reflect only 3%. Nonetheless, there's no need to be fatalistic about facing off with these fiery rocks. It's the only natural hazard that we can actually avoid, because you can't stop tornadoes, you can't stop hurricanes, uh, you can only deal with their effects. But we could actually stop an asteroid impact. But we need bigger telescopes for the smaller rocks. It's true that the smaller ones, there are a lot more of them, so we have to keep working on finding them. And we do find them when they fly by Earth, and very often they come out in the news. But 
they don't need to fly by that close. They can fly by further away than the moon, several times further away than the moon, and we can still see them. So really, how far away can you find something that's, you know, the size of a motel or something like that? The size of a motel. Um, many tens of lunar distances. A few million miles. Yeah, a few million miles. But again, it depends on how dark it is. But is that enough? I mean, how many, by the time they get within a few million miles, they're already, you know, kind of close to us. I mean, don't you want to find them farther away? We would like to find them further away, and there is a proposed space telescope that will look in the infrared that will be able to do just that if NASA selects it to launch. It's called NEOCAM out of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We do need large telescopes. There is a very large telescope coming online in the early 2020s, which is the largest synoptic survey telescope, and we hope that we'll be able to discover many more near-Earth asteroids with that telescope because it's at eight meters in size. But for now, we are able just to look with Earth-bound telescopes. So we have to look in reflected sunlight, and we need them to come by close. But right now, we're discovering several hundred of the smaller asteroids every year. So out of millions, we could find a few hundred a year at, at the present rate. Yes, but not all of them are dangerous or hazardous to Earth. I assume uh, most of them are not. Exactly, most of them are not. So really, we only want to find the ones that might impact Earth. And those are the ones that will pass close to Earth first. Now let me ask you, if you will, the second and maybe the bigger question. Suppose we find a rock, I don't know, you know, 20 meters, 50 meters in size, and it's going to hit, you know, some place where it would wipe out a city or or, or cause a tsunami or something like that, and eventually we will find one of these things if we continue to find them. What are our options? What can we do? Well, that's an interesting range of sizes. So let, let's go with the higher end at 50 meters, because that is a size that is quite likely to make it to the ground or at least explode very close to the ground. So the effects would be uh, extremely damaging, whether it's over ocean or over land. Um, so it depends when we discover it. If we discover it a few years before it's going to impact, say it's one of these asteroids that's buzzing by Earth, we figure out its orbit and we see that it's going to hit us in six years after it does a few more close encounters with Earth, then we can mount a mission to deflect it. And there have been a number of studies using uh, from nuclear weapons to uh, gravity tractors, which is a way of pulling the asteroid very slowly. And if we had enough time, we could mount a mission to fly out and push the asteroid out of the way. And you only need to push it a little bit if you push it far ahead enough of time that by the time it comes to the Earth, it will miss the Earth. Now, if we discover it, say, six months out, then there's not enough time to mount a mission because we don't have rockets ready to launch. In that case, we would have to evacuate. Um, and if you live in the US, you'll be happy to know that FEMA has been looking into this over the past few years and they have measures in place they have done exercises uh, the same way they train for tornadoes and hurricanes they are now training for asteroid impacts and we are encouraging other countries to follow suit and the un recently recommended that two organizations be set up one of them is the international asteroid warning network that the minor planet center the nasa and uh, other units in the u.s are a part of and that has been set up to communicate the hazard and in case that we do discover an asteroid on an impact course to be able to effectively communicate what the exact danger is where it's going to hit what the damage can be and what should be done about it but i'm certain that we spend every week uh, more on various military campaigns in far-off countries than we have spent in the total history of homo sapiens on this problem so how do you rate the impact hazard is it just a nice thing to think about, maybe a good subject for movies, or is this a truly existential threat that we've got to get ourselves in gear about? It's complicated to speak about this because it's the only natural hazard that we can actually avoid because you can't stop tornadoes, you can't stop hurricanes, uh, you can only deal with their effects, but we could actually stop an asteroid impact. The difference is that they don't happen very often. And when they do happen, they could have devastating consequences. Um, of course, everybody mentions the dinosaurs, but we have been hit on cosmic timescales since the beginning of Earth, really. Um, it has shaped, in many ways, life on Earth. And it's not a question of if we're going to get hit, it's a question of when. And it may be next week, it may be in a thousand years. 
but when is it you start buying insurance? The more we study them now, the more data we collect, the better prepared we're going to be for that day when we do find one that has our name on it. And I don't think you want to be the politician who is standing there being asked, hey, you knew this was a problem. Why didn't you spend money on this 10 years ago? So how many funds you devote to it? That's really up to the politicians. It's not the scientists. But I do think we need to buy the insurance policy. J.L. Galache, thanks so very much for speaking with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Seth. J.L. Galache is an astronomer at the Minor Planet Center at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. So with big enough telescopes, we could find and then keep an eye on the smaller asteroids. But as NASA will tell you, there's no such thing as a free launch. It'll cost money to find these lesser rocks. But that could be a more than justified expense. Hi, I'm Alex Tabarrok. I'm an economist at George Mason University. An asteroid hit can cost lives. It can also incur enormous economic loss. There were injuries in Chelyabinsk, but thankfully no lives were lost. Nonetheless, the price tag for the infrastructure damage that this spectacular explosion caused ran into the tens of millions. And so when we decide whether to buy insurance, says Alex Tabarrok, we need to weigh cost against uncertainty. We have no idea where one will land, but anywhere near an urbanized area is going to be a tremendous cost, not just in human lives, but in physical damage. So we think about something like Hurricane Katrina. That cost the United States $125 billion, or Hurricane Sandy, that was $75 billion. So those are the kinds of numbers which are certainly possible from even a small asteroid, let alone a big one hitting. Okay, well, you're talking tens, maybe even hundreds of billions of dollars. That's beginning to be real money. So getting started with asteroid defense seems like good insurance. But I would imagine that depends on the actuarial tables. I mean, what is the probability of this happening? Do we have any idea if we're spending too much or too little on asteroid defense? We're definitely spending too little because we're spending basically nothing. <laughs> Could that be because defending against rocks from the sky is more of what you economists call a public good? Uh, and if so, tell me what a public good is. Sure. So I definitely think that's one problem. A public good is something which protects everyone, even if you don't pay for it. So for example, if we were to uh, put out some device to push the asteroid away to avoid the strike, even if you didn't pay for any of that rocket ship to go up there or laser to shoot it out of the sky, even if you didn't pay for it, you'd still be protected. Because you're protected whether you pay for it or not, Everyone has an incentive to sit back and say, hey, no, let, let the other guy do it. I'm going to be protected. Let, let the United States bear the burden. We'll leave that to them to protect the whole world from the asteroid strike. Well, are you optimistic about that? I mean, I can understand the American public might support something like the National Weather Service or, I don't know, maybe even earthquake monitoring because it's beneficial to a lot of Americans. If I'm a farmer in China, I don't care about earthquake safety in the United States, so I don't want to pay for that. But asteroids, as you point out, are a worldwide problem. How essential is it to get everyone to chip in? I mean, is that even feasible? I'm not that optimistic for the following reason. With these very small probability events, even when they have massive consequences, people tend to round down a small probability event to zero. So to even get people to think about asteroid defense when they haven't had very much experience with being hit by an asteroid, it's really hard. It's a project of imagination, of scientific thought. It's not something which people experience. So it's going to be very hard to convince them that this is a real threat sounds like you're not terribly optimistic that we're going to get more money for asteroid defense. I'm not, but here is where I am more optimistic. And that is, I think we may get asteroid defense as a side effect of other goods. In particular, I'm very optimistic about commercial development of outer space. So if we can get a lot of people in outer space mining the asteroids, if we can get you know people on the moon in a hotel or something like that, or a Mars exploration, the more things we have in outer space, the bigger the chance that we'll have something as a side effect ready to avert an asteroid strike if we discover that one is coming. So, you know, we have some asteroid miners up there and maybe we can divert them to destroy an asteroid if one is heading towards us. Well, finally, Alex, I assume you would be willing to pay for asteroid defense. 
more or less, uh, how much per year is the right number in your mind? No, no, I'm perfectly rational. I'm not willing to pay for it either. <laughs> <laughs> I follow my own models. <laughs> so, so you're happy to be the beneficiary. You just don't want to be the, uh, the guy who's taxed for this. Yeah, I, I'm hoping that uh, you're going to pay for it, Seth. <laughs> All right, Alex. Well, I don't know whether I should thank you or not, but I'm going to. Alex Tabarrok, I want to thank you very much for speaking with us today. It's been great talking with you. Alex Tabarrok is an economist at George Mason University, and it sounds like, in his opinion, the pursuit of space mining might help us prepare for asteroid defense. Well, that's right. I mean, the more things and people we put into space, the more expertise we'll have to deal with unruly space rocks. For example, if there were crews out there mining asteroids, well, they could be diverted to helping deflect an incoming one. Indeed, I'm surprised he didn't mention that that's basically the plot of the film Armageddon. Okay, Bruce Willis was a deep-sea driller. <laughs> but still, who knew that that film might be prophetic? Well, maybe the screenwriters. I don't know. But anyway, in reality, landing hardware, if not humans, on a near-Earth asteroid is in our near future. Later in the show, a scientist working on NASA's first asteroid return mission. While we may peer anxiously at the skies for the menace from space, it's worth remembering that when meteors hit the Earth and cause no damage other than a pockmark, they are treasured as souvenirs from the darkest places of our solar system. It's like a message in a bottle, but from a sea hundreds of millions of miles away. That's poetic, Molly. But the rock might also be worth cashola. That's why I hightailed it over to see Sharon Cisneros at her home office of Mineralogical Research in San Jose, California. Her online business is buying and selling gems and meteorites, and I wanted to see if I'd struck gold with a rock that I found in the parking lot. Or rather, gold plus nickel, iridium, palladium, platinum, magnesium, and of course, iron. Well, the only thing I can say is just looking at it right off the bat, and hefting it, it's not really heavy. That doesn't mean anything, but uh, since it's so dirty, it's not really likely I could tell you exactly what kind of a rock it is, but it's not rounded. It doesn't have any what you'd call fusion crust on the outside of the sample, which would tend to make one think it might be a meteorite. The main thing about, uh, first of all, identifying a meteorite is to find out if it's magnetic. Yeah, well, I, I didn't, uh, I mean, we could put a piece of steel up against it, but I, I kind of, it can't be steel, it has to be a magnet. There's two kinds of magnetism. There's the magnetism that you get when you put a magnet on something, and then there is the magnetism from the actual magnet, and there are natural magnetite, which is an iron oxide, there are natural magnetite samples found in different places in the United States and around the world that are natural magnets. In other words, they will draw a piece of iron or a piece of iron-containing metal to it but a meteorite will not do that. Okay, so uh, people will probably call you up or, or even walk in saying, hey, look, I've found a meteorite. Are they often meteorites? No, they're just plain and simple, no. There's so many things what they call uh, meteor wrongs instead of meteorites. Many people look at a meteorite or they think they found something because it's really hot. Maybe they think it just fell out of the sky and it's still hot. Or they find something out in the desert that has a lot of holes in it. And meteorites generally don't have a lot of holes in them. But people have this preconceived idea that meteorites are supposed to be all pocked on the outside with, with holes, natural holes. So those are generally what people pick up and not likely. Now you've got a box here with a bunch of compartments, so just a cardboard box, and uh, some really interesting looking samples in there. Maybe maybe you could describe a couple of these things. Well, um, first of all, there are three basic types of meteorites. There's stony meteorites, uh, stony iron, and iron meteorites. And over here on the table, there are some stony meteorites. The No, the ones, the green ones. Oh, the green ones. Right? That, green? Yeah. It's that, hard for me to tell what's no green. Problem. Yeah. It's not easy to tell well, green. I know. Um, anyway, those, there are two of them there, oh. and those are from um, Tunisia. All right, now this other one really does look uh, kind of stony. It looks, I don't know, I mean, it sort of has a metal, metallic yeah, well, look. This one, this is a stony iron. This one here, as a matter of fact, has been cut in half and polished. And if you look at the, at the halves of it, you can see the metal in there. Yeah. And if you put a magnet on it, it'll draw a magnet very strongly in those places. But on the outside... Looks kind of like your rock, huh? <laughs> yes, except apparently it doesn't, <laughs> except for that part. 
you know, I, I hate to be crass about it, but if I if I were to want to buy one of these, like, you know, I don't know, something that weighed a pound, I mean, how much do they go for typically? Well, the prices are on them. Oh, oh, wait a minute. That they're, was they're, $1,400. $1,400. Yeah. I, I didn't see the little tags. They're all hidden. It's like in the jewelry stores <laughs> at night. I, no, they're, each one of them has a price, and the price is dependent upon the rarity um, as well as the condition of it. In other words, whether it's had some work done on it to polish it like these. That one is a natural condition. Okay, so per, per gram or per ounce, typically, what can you expect to pay then? Uh, anywhere for a, a, from a dollar a gram for the Australian one over there to $30, $40, dollars a gram, typically stuff like this here. This is one of the more expensive ones. It's $40 a gram. Perhaps you remind people, material. I think it's like 450 grams in a pound or something yeah, like that, yeah. right? So uh, that gives you, you know, it's at least $450 a pound and, and up from there. You know, there, there are people, Sharon, who say that all meteorites should go to museums and not to shops and things like that. And right. It's sort of like, I mean, maybe you could make an analogy with dinosaur bones. Uh, they all ought to be in, in, you know, academic collections and things like that. What do you say to that? Um, really rare ones found in the U.S., the government has a right to confiscate them. Really? Yeah. yeah, but they usually want, they'll take a small piece of it uh, just so that they have a sample of it. The Smithsonian Institute keeps all the meteorites, and then pretty much they could take the whole thing, but they don't, and then you are free to sell it, but you got to have documentation. You just, that's the one thing that's so important is the documentation. Well, finally, Sharon, I mean, you know, you've seen these things every day for a long time, do you still find them interesting and exciting? Absolutely, yeah. And let me show you with this one right here. This is what they call a palisite, and it's one of the um, beautiful meteorites because... Oh, it's translucent. It's you can translucent. look through it. Yeah, they have... Nice all, green color when you look through it. Olivine and metal, and the metal is like a Swiss cheese thing. Oh, yeah. With the olivine in the middle. It, they, it's a piece of jewelry, really. Yeah, it, yes, these, these are for jewelry. They make jewelry out of them. They're beautiful. Sharon Cisneros, thanks so very much for uh, talking to me. That was fun. Sharon Cisneros deals in gems and meteorites at the Mineralogical Research Company in San Jose, California. Well, why wait for the rock? To come to you. That's NASA's motto. The agency is launching its first sample return mission to an asteroid. We talk to a scientist working on the mission next. Rock on. It's Asteroids on Big Picture Science. Big Picture Science is also supported in part by Podiversity. Podiversity offers easy access to ad-free podcasts on Android devices. Your subscription to Podiversity helps support the production of Big Picture Science and your other favorite podcasts. Follow your favorite shows and have new episodes downloaded automatically to your Android device. You can download Podiversity from the link at bigpicturescience.org or at podiversity.com. As Sharon Cisneros reminds us, asteroids contain the minerals and metals that are the building blocks of the solar system. And a primordial rock known as Bennu is one that's soon to be famous. At 1,600 feet across, or roughly 500 meters, it's one of the smaller asteroids, just the ones we've been talking about. And technically, it's on a collision course with Earth. We'll get to that. But that's not what will make it a rock star. Bennu is rich in the geology that scientists hope will tell us something about the birth of the solar system. And NASA is not waiting for it to visit us to get a close look. After all, who wants to write a grant to do research in the year 2135, which is when Bennu will get up close and personal with Earth? No, NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission is going to land on Bennu. It's the agency's first sample return mission from an asteroid. The mission's deputy program scientist is Christina Ritchie, who normally works at NASA headquarters, but we reached her in Florida, home to Cape Canaveral. Okay, Christina, the launch is coming up. What is happening at Cape Canaveral? So we are going through the last reviews and meetings before we have launch on Thursday. So we are looking forward to taking off on Thursday. That's very exciting. Yes, my mother is coming to see her first launch So at the Cape, so she's extremely excited. Why did NASA choose Bennu from the half a million or so known asteroids in our solar system? 
So the science team, when they were trying to select the destination asteroid for OSIRIS-REx, took into account three critical factors. The first one's accessibility of the asteroid. We needed something nearby and that has a similar orbit to Earth, and Bennu's got that. We had to take into account the size of the asteroid so that it would enable operations close to the asteroid, as well as the actual collection of that sample, and Bennu came out to be the right size for us. And we had to take into account the scientific importance of the composition of the asteroid. And Bennu is a carbon-rich asteroid, so it's got preserved primitive material. So really, it hit all three of our criteria and easily came out as the target destination asteroid. But aren't all asteroids made in a similar fashion? Why would the composition of Bennu be different from other asteroids? So some are metallic and some are rocky. In Bennu's particular case, it's carbon rich. It's gone through some of the collisions we have within our solar system as it's forming and evolving. But the nice thing about Bennu is we know its geologic history. We know the the history it's gone through to get to where it is now. And it's carbon rich, so it's preserving some of these primitive organic molecules that may have led to life either here on Earth or elsewhere within the solar system. And you'll be interested in in looking at those molecules as well as the geology of this asteroid when the samples return to Earth. Absolutely. The composition of this asteroid will be very fascinating, and in particular, those organic molecules, those precursors to life. Well, I want to get to that, but shouldn't we point out that Bennu is one of the small asteroids that has a high probability of hitting Earth, even if that date with destiny is a century away? I mean, it's headed for us, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's cl- Well, I don't want to say it's heading towards us. It is classified as a potentially hazardous asteroid. But I think you and I have a slightly different definition of high probability. So the probability of Bennu impacting Earth in the next few hundred years is one-tenth of one percent. So when people ask me this question, I like to say, deep breath in and now let it go. Because it's not something we're actually concerned about impacting Earth. But what we are interested in learning about from it is how asteroids move. So by going to Bennu and studying the special effect that's known as the Yarkovsky effect, which is a force that causes a change in the orbit of asteroids, we'll be able to understand other asteroids as well, other ones that are potentially more hazardous. And is it the change in the orbit that sometimes send them towards us? Yes. Yeah. So this Yarkovsky effect is basically, it's a force that's caused by the emission of heat from one of these rotation objects that just slightly changes that orbit. And that's what could send an asteroid towards us. So by us going to Bennu and studying this effect, we'll be able to understand other asteroids as well. Okay, if we're speaking of time, how long will it take the OSIRIS-REx spaceship to travel to Bennu? So after we launch on September 8th, we've got a year until we do an Earth gravity assist. So basically we slingshot ourselves around Earth such that we can then get to Bennu by August of 2018. Now, this is a sample return mission. So what technology do you need to land on an asteroid? I mean, that's a delicate procedure right there, but you have to take off again. So we don't actually land on the asteroid. It's more like a slow, safe, five-second high five is the easy way to look at it. You touch the asteroid. Yes. So what we do is we use our thrusters to do a close approach. And and I should note, we don't do a sample acquisition until after two years of the asteroid of doing intense studies of these different potential sample sites. So then we go in with an 11-foot arm that's known as TAGSAM, the touch-and-go sample acquisition mechanism. And just think of it as a very long arm, about 11 feet long, that has a circular disc-like container on the bottom of it. And that container slightly touches the asteroid, and we have containers of nitrogen gas on the end of that so that we can shoot the nitrogen gas out, make the surface material kick up, and go into the canister. And then we use our thrusters to get back away from the asteroid. And then we measure our sample to make sure we have the right amount before we stow it. It reminds me of trying to catch guppies or something in in a stream. I mean, they can be very slippery. It could be elusive. Uh, you have to be quite nimble, for one, yes. and quick. Yes. So for starters, we're already going to be matching the rotation period of this asteroid with our spacecraft. So we're ready for that. The spacecraft will be in sync with the asteroid. That's what you're saying. Yes, correct. So we'll be doing a very slow approach towards the asteroid. And so that when we go to touch that surface for those five seconds, it will be very 
delicately done is the easy way to put it. We'll, we'll have control of this as it's occurring. And we actually have three tanks of nitrogen gas on board our tag SAM so that the first attempt doesn't quite work out. We can go back and do it again another time. But still, this is precision engineering. Welcome to NASA. <laughs> and there, it sounds like there won't be a, a landing like there was in the not quite documentary film Armageddon where they land on this <laughs> asteroid and it's jagged and it's you know treacherous. That's not what's happening. No, that's not what's happening at all. We <laughs> okay. are doing two years of surveying and detailed mapping before we even choose our sample location site so that we can ensure that we protect our spacecraft. Well, let's talk about that sample. So it sounds like we're not talking about bringing home a big chunk of the rock. This is a small bit of the asteroid, but still there is a lot of science uh, that can be yes. applied to it. Yeah, so our goal is to bring back somewhere between 60 grams and two kilograms. And I, I know that sounds tiny. We're talking, you know, just over two ounces to anywhere up to four pounds. But, you know, for context, this is actually the largest sample return since the Apollo era. So it is actually a significant amount of material that we are bringing back. So much so that we're gonna give 25% of that material to the science team to be able to answer all the questions that they want to do as part of their mission. And then 75% of the sample is actually gonna be stored for future generations of scientists. So this mission is gonna be the gift that keeps on giving in terms of sample return. So you have this sample, this rare and, and precious sample from yeah. an asteroid. Could you give us an idea of the kind of questions you hope to answer, say, about the origins of our solar system? You know, asteroids are these remnants of the original building blocks of our solar system. So by having this rare, pristine sample, we're going to be able to understand material that's preserved from four and a half billion years ago. So this is the basic building blocks material that, you know, everything within our solar system formed from. That's a pretty big question right there in and of itself. But don't we know how the solar system formed? We do understand how the solar system formed, but one of the things we don't have in great context is that primitive organic material that can be found within these carbon-rich asteroids, like Bennu. So we'll be able to detail and understand that more by bringing this pristine sample here, we'll be able to do analyses that we could never do with a spacecraft. There's no chance that there is life on an asteroid, but it sounds like it has the organic compounds that gave ro rise to life on Earth, at least. Correct, yes. Yeah, the, the big thing that's missing from Bennu is going to be water. Well, finally, uh, Christina, we know that uh, asteroids and meteorites are valuable material scientifically, but also for collectors, and sometimes yes. people buy and trade in them. Well, once you've analyzed the samples that come from Bennu and you've cataloged them, who gets them? Do you think they'll find their way they to the market? No, they are, they are property of, of NASA. They, they will actually be stored at the curation control facility of NASA Johnson Space Center. That's the place where we actually stored the Apollo samples. And they will be available to scientists to use for future generations to come to understand questions we haven't even thought of yet. So we're going to keep this going for a while. Christina Ritchie is a planetary scientist at NASA headquarters in D.C., but we reached her at Cape Canaveral in Florida. She is the deputy program scientist for NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission. Christina, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. And best of luck on the launch. Great. Thank you so much. Well, what we've learned in the show is that the solar system is stuffed with, what, 100 million asteroids bigger than a football field? We all know about the big ones but they're being tracked. It's the small ones, asteroids that could take out a city. I mean, they could really pack a punch in and, and be really dangerous. And they're hard to see, so we need big telescopes, but it's not clear who's gonna step up to the plate to write the check to build those scopes. And we'll also learn more about these small asteroids with the OSIRIS-REx mission of NASA. I mean, that would tell us how easy it might be to defend against some of these smaller rocks, but also we'll learn what mix of molecules rain down on the early Earth literally precipitating the start of life, and what could be more interesting than learning about how we were born. We 
want to thank the rock star crew who help us produce this show, Gary Niederhoff and Barbara Vance. And thanks to financial support from Rena Sholsky David and Sammy David and the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization and home to the Allen Telescope Array. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to the episode Asteroids. I'm Molly Bentley. I'm Seth Chostag. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, well, you'll find lots of episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener, but you prefer to listen to over-the-air radio because it also carries rock stations, well, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry our program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. And if you listen to our show via iTunes, well, we invite you to leave a review of our show on our iTunes page. And to reach us directly with your comments, be sure to throw in some praise, and then email it all to bigpicturescience at seti.org. Peter, this is an actual fragment of an asteroid right here that I'm holding. Yes, but please don't hold it in your hands because, you know, your fingers have all these these dirts and salts in them and they actually hurt the rocks. It's not that a rock hurts you, it's you can hurt the rocks. I am so sorry. <laughs> okay, what I touched there briefly and I put it back in its box is a chunk of our early solar system. Yes, right? it is. It's older than any rock on Earth. Okay, I'm going to close this box carefully. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs>